I'm Raquel Garcia Lauritsen and a member of the Wednesday Writers Group at Woodland Pattern Book Center. I'm going to tell you about the Wednesday Writers Group and the poets you are about to hear in a few minutes. In 2009, as part of a national creativity and aging initiative, Woodland Pattern Book Center offered a six week memoir and poetry workshop. This effort met with an enthusiastic response and when it ended, the group continued to meet adding a few new members along the way. By October 10th, 2012, they gave themselves a new name, the Wednesday Writers. As time went on, the Wednesday Writers expanded their mission to include writers who were dedicated not only to memoir and poetry, but also to short stories, plays, essays, and other literary forms. Our diverse convivial group ranges from beginning writers to the experienced. We come together sharing a love of the written word and greatly enjoy our meetings where we read our work and benefit from the wholesome critique of the others. Currently, there are 19 members who continue to meet faithfully and sometimes not so faithfully at Woodman Pattern Book Center in its art gallery and meeting room every Wednesday from 1 to 3 p.m. Of course, right now we're doing it via Zoom. We usually have about seven or so members in attendance at any one meeting. Normally, we could sit together around the large meeting table where one person agrees to serve as moderator for the day and asks us if we have any announcements. Sometimes someone wants to share information about a, an upcoming event or provide the title of a good book on writing. Then there's a show of hands as to who has brought something to read and the copies that are brought are distributed. Attendance is encouraged even if you haven't written anything. We're all ears as the author reads their work, whereupon we provide wholesome feedback and discussion. I have benefited greatly from hearing the opinions and suggestions of my fellow writers. It's also motivational and their encouragement makes me want to write more. We all aspire to write every day, not just on Wednesdays. About 20 minutes before the end of our meeting, we have a prompt, which is an opportunity to write on a topic for the day spontaneously which we do for about 10 minutes and then we go around the room and everyone reads what they had written. It is purely for enjoyment and to express our amazement at the many different ways in which writers express themselves on the same subject. The Wednesday Writers is very grateful to Woodland Pattern for providing us with a wonderful place to hold our weekly meetings. The team working there is always welcoming and helpful. This year, as we have several times in the past, we are presenting our poetry as part of Woodland Pattern's poetry celebration. The Wednesday writer poets that you will see and hear in just a few minutes include Suzanne Rosenblatt, Lolly Jesutarski, Barbara Lee, Janine Arsenault, Virginia Small, Susan Winnicky, and Karen Haley. I am pleased to present these Wednesday writer poets. Hello, my name is Suzanne Rosenblatt, and um, I became a poet because somebody asked me, well, Clyde Morgan asked me to write something for him to dance to, and I met with him regularly for a few months, and then all of a sudden, instead of writing a story, or I wrote a poem, and the poem got me into the Earth Poets um, in 1988, which changed my life and made me an Earth Poet. <laughs> and I've been one ever since, and will be performing um, virtually, I guess, our street live stream on Earth Day this year at Linneman's. And here's one of my early poems, um, but it's a good time to read it, I thought, because everyone's planning planting, and, well, this will speak for itself. Here, lilac, we deny all beauty to a dandelion past its prime, graying the grass like a tuft of shed dog hair, we ignore its star design till it's our own time to be blown away. 
then perhaps we look more closely. Denying then the lion, denying then the lion. Thistles are a step below dandelions on everyone's hit list but mine, though I just placed my hand on a spine. It's the gleam of sunshine through lavender that makes me forgive their thorns. Wildflowers are far more delicate and transparent, far more delicate and transparent than those we have cultivated in our own image. Denying then the lion, denying then the lion. If I designed a carpet to cover our living room floor, I'd interweave Sweet William, Black-Eyed Susan, Scarlet Flax, Wild Rose, with Cosmos, Butterflies, Squirrels, Earwigs, Crows. I'd model it after our front lawn. Most people, I'll admit, do the opposite. They turn their lawn into a carpet, weed free, bee free, bird free, turd free, no irregularity, simply, basically solid green. Do I offend the neighbors with my dandelions and clover, exposing every yard to noxious seeds? Or is it the offending me? spewing toxic herbicides into air and water supplies to rid those rugs of weeds. Denying dandelion, denying dandelion, your drug, your drug, your drug. Lilac was a lively, loving, shaggy mutt who died with almost no warning. She'd slowed up quite a bit, had lost her usual dash. But then one day she could barely breathe. Her muscles became flaccid. She was a limp, cuddly dog doll, wanting a few last packs of affection. And now, I watch the early morning dog walkers who aren't thinking their dogs will one day die, as Lilac did, aren't contemplating the fact that their walking future ghosts and I, myself a future ghost, watch the flap of ears, the tail wag, the must of fur, the whiskers, trying to catch a glimpse of the past to preserve her image in the future. Dogs, I think I know the answer to why you all have cancer. Beware of sniffing grasses. It's safer sniffing asses. You're peeing down the wrong weeds. You're watering the wrong seeds. Do it in the living room or on the kitchen floor. Do it on the New York Times, but don't go out the door. Never go outside and inhale the pesticide. I know it too well, for our dog died. The Jensen's lost Ginger, Wendy lost Star. Dogs, you're not safe wherever you are. There's nothing to tell you, no warning signs to keep away from those lethal dandelions. The gastric brooding frog of Australia swallows its fertilized eggs. Six weeks later, it regurgitates froglets. The gastric brooding frog of Australia used to swallow its fertilized eggs. No longer, no longer done in, undone, missing since 1981. 
Colorado's Bufo Boreas immune system collapse, Canada's chorus and leopard frogs becoming part of Earth's past, the Costa Rican glass frog, lime green, the Yosemite toad, the Wyoming toad, all seldom seen. The mountain frog, the cascades frog, the frogs in Ecuador and Bangladesh, frogs in pristine ponds on mountain crests. Frogs worldwide are dying, have died. 200 million years or more, frogs outlasted the dinosaur, outlasted every freeze and thaw. They're hardier than we are, hardier than we are. Denying dandelion, denying dandelion, your drug, your drug. Dun in dun dun, dun in dun dun, dun in dun dun. Human genes are 99% identical to those of African chips, the chimps and gorillas. Only 1% of the words in our genetic message need be altered to change a human into a chimp. 99% identical chimp, 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 chimpanzees. Environmental disturbances suppress fish immunity, suppress frog immunity, suppress dog immunity, worm immunity, sperm immunity, panda, penguin, right up, chimpanzees. There's a worldwide rash of immune disease, yet it seems the human community assumes that we can act with impunity, presumes to escape scot-free, yet whatever we scatter, sprinkle, spray, pee, rains right back down upon you, upon me fills reservoirs, aquifer, soil, and sea, dampens the global community. Denying dandelion, denying dandelion, your drug, your drug, your drug, lilac, lilac, here lilac. Dun in dun dun, dun in dun dun, dun in dun dun, 99% identical chimp, 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 chimpanzees, immune disease, immune disease, dun in dun dun, dun in dun dun, dun in dun dun. Greetings from Lali Zizitarski. And I'm happy to be participating today. And I've decided I would like to read a story poem from this book, Trick of Witch, Wet a Hedgehog, Save Your Soul, An American Artist Encounters Poland. About 17 years ago, we had an amazing encounter with my husband's Polish first cousins that had never met. And during several trips to Poland, I learned a lot about Polish folklore, history, and of course, familial history. And the result is this book that is um, stories that I've written, illustrated with sculptures that I've made. And today I'm going to share a story of a very ill-fated prince and his wife. Um, he's a mouse prince and he ends up being devoured by mice. Spoiler alert. The narrative voice is pictured here. And this is Mokosh, an ancient Polish earth goddess. And in my book, 
she manifests herself today as an old woman with a basket of tails. And now we have Prince Papil and his wife. The narrative voice, as I said, is Mokosh. Light 10 thunder candles for the uncles, then light two more candles for their betrayers. There is death here. By the time I returned to this castle, I was already too late. I hid myself in the branches of the ancient linden tree beside the gate. They didn't grasp the covenant between love and hate, between greed and greatness. They mistook a wealth of grain and gold for wealth of the soul. Learn from Prince Papil and his devious queen. Greed got stuck between the old king's teeth like a stringy piece of mutton. He listened to his queen with ears stuffed with sweetmeats of vain glory. And she whispered, let's poison their good for nothing uncles while they brag about how they're leaders of legions. They squander all our provisions with her gluttony and lavish feasting into the night. And food is money these days with this cursed famine in the land. We can't afford this any longer down with the uncles. Poison their meat. Let's serve them right, those leeches. We'll serve them one last meal and watch them groan and sleep. And Prince Paul Peel hissed, yes. I never liked that woman. Never trusted her since I saw her turn away, a starving beggar woman in the kitchen door, and even more, had her beaten, left for dead. But let's not place all the blame on the queen. After all, the prince could have said no. Quickly, they dared this dolorous deed. Then slick as slithery snakes, they slipped the bloated bodies into the moat, weighted down with grain sacks filled with rocks. Yes. There were whispers among the castle rooks and pawns, everyone guessed, but not even the bishop dared hint at the, where the uncles had gone. These were hard times in our land, withered crops, wasted herds, Swedish invaders seeking their advantage, swooping across the plains, harvesting peasants like sheaves of grain beneath their sighs. But then came Prince Papil's day of reckoning, the enemy at the river, and no one to defend the borders. No armies to be rallied, no uncles to give the orders. The wretched king now rode a small boat to his granary tower in the moat, where he and his queen spent their last desperate hours watching the dust clouds as the invaders neared. Fearless, I stood on the outer edge of the moat, helpless as they were devoured, nibbled bit by bit by bit by the granary mice. I heard them weep for their uncles, for their lives, for their hapless homeland, all the while cursing themselves for their own misdeeds. Their cries will haunt my sleep. Light the thunder candles, they are gone. The dirges will begin at dawn. Together we will sing a funeral song. Gaze on this granary tower, their tomb. Think of their legacy of doom. The land will be ours again. We are tenacious as the grassy plains we are rooted in. We will survive. Better to learn this lesson, though, and learn it well. Humble or haughty, when greed haunts a house, it may be brought down by a mouse. Hi everyone, my name is Susan Winicky and I live just down the street at the Newport and I have been with this writing group for a very long time. And um, one of the things I've learned is that you can bring beauty to anything, absolutely anything with a little imagination and some slices of quiet time. So here's a little offering. Here's some offerings for you from me. The first one is called Love and Eggs are best when they are fresh. 
That's from a Russian proverb. Eggs. Last night for dinner, I cracked a couple of you into a cast iron frying pan with a thin layer of olive oil on its bottom. You poured yourselves elegantly into the hot, smooth palm of pan, your mustard colored yolk floating in the silky pond that holds you dear. How tender you looked in that black rimmed fry pan. How quickly you surrendered to the call of hot oil from raw to ready in no time. I gingerly lifted you onto the stainless steel spatula and laid you gently on the sparkling clean glass plate. You were carried to the table with a golden slice of sourdough gracing your sides. I carefully pierced your white veiled eye with my fork and you broke open sinuously, shyly, releasing your goodness all over the plate. I lifted to my waiting lips a bite of your delicate doneness and sighed in gratitude. How splendid you tasted. How delighted I was to take your deliciousness into my own. Another dozen of you lie waiting in separate paper crate th thrones in the refrigerator. We must have more of these tantalizing tete a and we will. We will never be long from one another. I promise you that, precious eggs, precious eggs. Okay, and this one is called Lilacs. Oh, the winter is long, she laments. When will he come? Her Robin, her Romeo. Oh, she hears him, his tender, heart-wrenching song calls to her, arousing, stirring. He perches beneath the balcony of lush green foliage and awaits her. She sashays toward his song of summons, gowned in lavender, radiant with rapture. His Juliet appears. Oh, she's timid, tentative at first, but seeing him, spring bursts forth in her. Delicate diminutive petals explode into fragrance, into joy, into thousands of Juliets. In clusters they come, spilling over themselves in wild abandonment. Romeo flits and flirts from balcony to balcony, intoxicated, his chest heaves with songs of sun returning. Earthworms rising, branches budding, mallards soaring along the thawing river. The Juliets make a brief appearance on their balcony of leaves, then disappear for a long rest behind their green convent walls until Romeo calls again next year. This one is a tribute to Lake Michigan, whom I love and whom, of course, living down the street from you, I live next to. Lake Michigan, you have summoned me from the deep forest of my thoughts, beckoning me to your benign blueness. You have lured me from the lair of my loneliness, cradling me in the luxury of your liquid lap. You ripened me, sweetened me, revealed yourself to the wild sea within me. I empty the pockets of my heart to make room for you, to make love for you to make prayer for you, Lake Michigan. And finally, this is a letter to death. Dear death, one day, the holy breath you whispered into my body at birth will cease, will draw to a close. I will be yours then, birthed into your unfathomable mystery. I want to be awake for your coming. I want to be welcoming. I want to come to you willingly as I did when you entered me. I want to surrender to you when you tap at my door, as I do at the end of each day, as I turn off the light to enter the soft womb of darkness. I put myself in your trust, dear death. Thank you for all this rehearsal time.
Sincerely, Susan. Thank you. It is a privilege to have the opportunity to read some of my poetry today at the St. John's Festival. I'd like to say hello to my friends who live there. A little about myself. I've always enjoyed writing and studied British and American literature in college and graduate school. I taught English at various places, but my main career for 32 years was serving not-for-profit organizations in the areas of development and marketing. I'm going to read five poems from my chapbook entitled The Wind People. The first one is sad, but the others aren't. Hey lady. This is written in memory of Major Charles David Austin, US Air Force, MIA, Vietnam. Hey lady, wanna see something? Hey lady, over here, come with me. Only little money. I dreamed it was Memorial Day and nobody remembered me. Hey lady, this way, I show you. Down a dirty street, down a dirty stairs to a dirty cell. I've never been to Baghdad, but I hear the Garden Hotel is cool. I'm in Hanoi and it's plenty hot here at the Hilton. Oh my God, it's Dave, Dave. He's so emaciated. I've never been to Spain, but I kind of like the music. Hey Johnson, hey Nixon. I never made it to architecture school and they took my ham radio and now shot down, I'm a loser. Dave, you've never been to Benghazi. What difference does it make? What does it matter? Return to sender. The wind people. The wind people live in my house. I hear them late at night during a storm, whenever they choose. There's the one with a shrill voice, the one who likes to hammer the one who shouts and runs, and the one who moans. They tell me things I need to hear, reminding me of the hardships of newcomers to rocky shores, marshes rich with wildlife, salt flats, sandy bays, and remembering the furies of Norman's woe. They tell me their secrets, challenge me to be like them, and carry their spirit into my future. Ode to Childhood Sidewalks. Our childhood teachers always there waiting for us each morning as we arrived in Denham and Seersucker. You provided direction on the place where we learned to walk on stilts. Biking so fast out of control and without brakes, we sometimes dive si sideways to the grass to stop our unhelmeted heads candidates for concussion. It never happened. Fastening on roller skates, leather straps, we knew you would skin our knees and scrape our elbows, sending us home for mercurochrome, band-aids, and a kiss, only to race out again restored so as not to miss skipping rope or hopscotch. Step on a crack and break your mother's back. We played and played sans sunscreen on your hard surface, perfect for smashing caps with a hammer. The acrid smell, our reward for accuracy. You hosted Kool-Aid sales and we filled pitchers from the garden hose. Sometimes you hid our skate key until the day after the rain when we examined worms that had emerged from your crack. On Halloween, you ushered us through dark neighborhoods we hadn't seen, big kids leading, us running to keep up, lugging our sacks and laughing. Cooperation, failure and resilience were lessons you taught. Are you still teaching? Mostly a mother. I am mostly a mother, a career I prefer to no other. Better children I could never find, they continually occupy my mind. Sometimes it can be a daunting task, seeing them thrive is all that I ask. Rewards do come in many a way, especially on this Mother's Day. Peony season. Overnight, scouts steal upward like Cadmus dragon teeth. There's very little time for self-defense 
their strategy set beyond control of our species. Pushing up petulantly with utter confidence, strong red stems lead yield to green. Beady squads hint of their palate. Now deliberate buds, Spartoi, announce themselves and a battalion surges. The peonies are coming. Quickly find hoops to restrain the persistent shoots. Some spokes are tangled and twisted, rush for reinforcements. Bursting uncontrollably like popping corn, fearsome beauties are born, riotous explosions of deep rose, pink, and white fireworks. Rebels fail to stay within their wires and flop to the ground, soon harvested and redeployed by eager scissors. Their weight demands the largest vessels from the highest shelves. Ants are also attracted, riding the backs of the boys coming home. More vases descend. Time marches on. Blossoms soften, dropping petals and pollen to the table. Outside, there is retreat, and then they are gone, leaving solitary stalks and dry brown buds. Surrender, exhausted, and so are we. I am going to read a poem by Dr. Vijay Kolkari, who is an esteemed member of Wednesday Writers until his death in 2009. He wrote many interesting and entertaining things. And this poem is entitled Golf Ball. I like it so much that sometimes I just read it for fun because I'm a golfer. Golf Ball by Dr. Vijay Kolkari. In my hand, I hold a ball, white, dimpled, and rather small. Oh, how innocent does it appear, this harmless little sphere. By its size, I could not guess the awesome power it does possess. But since I fell under its amazing spell, I've gone back and forth from heaven and hell. My life has not been quite the same since I chose to play this annoying game. It rules my mind for hours on end, a fortune it has made me spend. To master such a tiny ball should not be very hard at all but my wishes the ball refuses and does exactly as it chooses. It has made me yell, curse, and cry. I hate myself and want to die. It promises a thing called par if I hit it straight and far. It hooks and slices, dribbles and dies, and even disappears before my eyes. Often it will have a whim to hit a tree or take a swim. With miles of grass on which to land, it finally finds a patch of sand. Then it has me offer my soul, if only it would drop into the hole. It's made me whimper like a pup and swear I will give it up. I take a drink to ease my sorrow, but ball knows I'll be back tomorrow. Hello everyone, my name is Virginia Small. I'm a writer and a journalist, and I've been writing poetry since I was a teenager. But I'm a newbie in the Wednesday Writers. I've joined just this past year during COVID, and it's been a, a great blessing in my life since then. The poems I'm going to read today are from a, an unpublished uh, collection called Ties, Knots, and Loose Ends, Threads of a Farm Family. And I'd like to say hello to all the people uh, that I know at St. John's and to all those I have not yet met. Home team. We created a diamond in the space between the barn, the shed and the garage. Coaxing even preschoolers, he taught eight girls and four boys how to stand just so over the plate, how to pitch to keep the ball from being hit, how to run like the Dickens and use a glove like a net, how to score a clinch run with a daredevil bunt. Gray haired, he confided once or twice that he and Uncle George might have tried for the big time if it weren't for the farm. Summer evenings after frenzied supper cleanup, all of us kids eventually got our turn at bat, elbows outstretched, showing off our form, 
and winning a pat on the back. Even the little kids sometimes belted a mean line drive or leaped to snare a pop-up. We bickered over wearing the best gloves and whether base runners were safe and we cheered great plays on either side. As twilight threatened to close in on our family game, we stood at attention in the outfield, in the batter zone, my father's shadow everywhere, everywhere. That was for Raymond Joseph Small. And this is stitching for Elizabeth Barbie and Small. Her many children grown, our mother stitches. Strand by strand, she hooks vibrant heavy wool into deep piled rugs. She embroiders fine silk threads into peacocks, oranges, orchids, on table linen and pillow covers. Each day she spends hours and hours stitching, eyes and fingers focused in and out, in and out. Before there was no time when stitching was just another chore, when tired fingers pierced cloth without pleasure, when words were strewn without finesse. These threads, these new threads, a language not voiced with the tongue, she bequeaths to her daughters and sons and their daughters and sons. Signature, simple gifts. This is the last one I'll read. It's called Mirror Image. I'll never forget the way your face looked those last days, a blurry mirror image of a young girl's portrait, sweet hazel eyes engaged, reaching, soft lines and wonder. In the end, you returned to a place I never knew. You turned inside out and I turned with you back to shadowy origins, wordless holding of hands, stroking of faces, lavishing touches like butter on hot sweet corn. In the end, there was little to say when you could no longer form words and what I wanted to, most to say did not require speech. In the end, Silence swelled like a belly before birth. In the end, I listened to your breath, a grandfather clock ticking, a haunting lullaby. There was nothing to do but listen and touch, nothing but watching your body breathe, a child watching over a mother a mirror image, a child, a mother, a slow, subtle breath before sleep. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Karen Haley, and um, I'm pleased to be part of this group, have been for several years. It's much more difficult now that we have to be on Zoom, but this is working. As for the poetry, in this time when the word immigrant is so much in the news, I've been thinking about how I'm not very far removed from that. And so it's a little daunting to put thoughts in another person's mouth but these were some of mine. My grandfather came to the United States when he was 16. It's called Father of My Father. When I look for you, I see a stripling 
a young man, only lately in long pants, in traveling clothes. You stand at a rail, fear-tempered, face the undulation, the unsteady sensation in this silent sea, empty save for misting wind, heavy with salt on your lips. You may think, how will I look in the fields of strangers, build faces on my days, trade furrows of darker ground for the valley I knew. Feet solid, I will be rooted in all I grow, lay aside my youth for possibilities. As long as the place grows green, the fields rolling, soil strong in my hand, I will know how to stand. And if you have any problems with insomnia, you might be able to relate to this one, waking. I open my eyes to the dark between sleeping and waking. Find a place there for my thoughts with no edges, no binding threads to confuse or confine. Unconformed, they wander. And I revel in the shining newness to be found in that quiet, side by side with music, voices long gone, but familiar and warm as a night breeze from summer. I hasten to commit them to memory before dawn's approach can erase all with the urgency of its light. Another one about sleep. It's called possibly to sleep. If there are owls calling simple notes from the tall fragrant spruce, night will seem less separate, less solid in its blackness, seem more possible to breathe deeply, even to lay awake, content to be there, to hear, to notice, to notice the strong curve, the white light curve of moon. When owls are silenced, left with fewer br branches to perch, to nest and be hidden by the day, shelter is less easily found, those tall straight trees coveted as possessions. Then I'm left with less comfort, ride circles of thought, find less light. I'm more reminded of the dark we all carry, missing even the possibility of owls. And I'll end with a touch of spring. Spring can be earliest daffodils pushing up through leaf litter, spears of first green to grow an inch in a day, the scylla and tiny crocus, purple drops of strong color sprinkled here and there in sheltered places. But it can also be sitting in sun on the almost warm steps, waiting to greet the mailman for the first time since snow made his rounds and exercise in solitude. It can be hanging out sheets, freshly washed, to blow in the still cool breeze with the sun so warm on my back, it traces the outlines of seasons change, the leaving of winter. Thank you. Hello everyone. It's so good to see, well, not see you, but know that you're there. <laughs> um, I have many friends at St. John's, so hello to you and hello to all of you that I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to tell you the strange and twisted tale of how I got to France and how it changed my life. I was born in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, but ever since I can remember, I just really wanted to go to France. It was probably all the fairy tales my mom read to us, or maybe it was all the fairy tales that I read from the library. But in any case, it was like France. It was a magical place of, of enchantment of castles, of princes, of transformation. 
I had no conscious thought of how I would get there. <clears throat> but I, I figured money might have something to do with it. After all, money can be magic. I remember when my first tooth came out, I think it was yanked and I didn't cry, but I felt bad for my tooth. <clears throat> and my mom said, well, just put it under your pillow. And something magic will happen. And so in the morning when I woke up, I looked under my pillow, my tooth was gone. It was a nickel <laughs> and a note from Twinkle Wand who encouraged me how brave I had been. If I had been naughty, I would have just gotten a note from Dinkle Stick, no nickel. <laughs> of course, what's really exciting about money is it helps you get what you want. And when I was little, what I really, really, really wanted, in addition to going to France, was a dog. Oh, yes, a dog. I mean, a book about dogs, and I just researched all the different breeds. I, I really wanted a, a collie, like Lassie come home. Yes. Oh, too big for our apartment. Oh, maybe a chihuahua. So, do you want a little? <laughs> oh, <clears throat> well, they could fall off the couch and break their legs. Oh. After begging, pleading, covering my bedroom wall with pictures, I really got desperate. I spent my allowance and I bought a doggy collar, which I wore. <laughs> and then I got a doggy leash. And then I got a doggy bowl. Well, when I started eating doggy biscuits, <laughs> that's when my parents gave in. I guess the lesson was a little creative persistence, not just money. A few years later, my father lost his job and I learned that it can be very scary not to have money. I started babysitting as soon as my parents and other parents would let me. And as soon as I turned 16, I got a job. I was working in a soda fountain in this little drugstore and I had to make burgers and fries and malts and. And there I was behind the counter, all these people staring at me all the time and I couldn't escape. It was so hard. <laughs> and then I got a job at Chauncey's Drive-In. But well, I thought it'd be better because people see me through the window. But uh -uh. I was serving my peers, all those high school kids. I was like, oh, so spotty. And then my boss was like, fast, 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 Barbara, fast, fast, fast. <clears throat> I had to learn a few things. I had to learn how to focus, but there were some perks. Like I had some of the best malts and burgers in town. <laughs> uh -huh. But then France, that seemed impossibly far away. How could I possibly afford it? But I took French in high school. I got good grades. I sent in my requests for I took the ACTs and in my craft requests for college and I got a work study scholarship at UW Madison <laughs> and a job <clears throat> working on scrape table in the dining hall UW Madison. <laughs> amazed at what people leave on their trays. It was enough to feed me for that whole year. So that's great. <clears throat> well After my freshman year, I got a summer job working at Wigwam Sock Factory, mostly stickering socks. Oh, it was so hot. There was no air conditioning. It was so boring, oh, <clears throat> stickering socks all day long. I had to set myself little tasks, like how many socks could I sticker in an hour? <sighs> but then thank goodness for music, once a week, we got to choose, all of us factory workers got to choose the song that we really wanted to hear. So here was their favorite. Hooray, hooray, they're taking me away. The man in the little white coats. <laughs> I'm all dressed up in my little straight jacket. Hey. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> laughing and creativity got me through that summer. But I was getting discouraged about getting to France on my meager earnings. And I was about to give up when I saw this notice in Bascom Hall. Wow, 
there was going to be a junior year abroad program and there would be scholarships available. And it was in Southern France, Aix-en-Provence. Oh my God, I had to try this. I sent in my application and I had to just wait. Well, my sister and I got this, a job again at Wigwam for a second summer, but uh, it was really hard for me to concentrate. <clears throat> I was trying to read Sartre was being and nothingness. Seemed like just way too ironic. And then I got the letter. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> I got the letter. I got a scholarship to go to France. Oh, I was just way too excited to stay at Wigwam. But fortunately, my sister had a good friend who would stay with her and take my job. So I went back to Madison and I studied French and I dreamed a whole lot. <laughs> and that September, there I was on the New Amsterdam, a cruise ship, cheaper than the airline. Of course, it was kind of a, a rocky, rolly experience, but <laughs> fortunately for me, I loved the rocking motion. And even when the big wave hit and all the dining and furniture went <laughs> to the left, I still kind of giggled. <laughs> all was well. <sighs> when I got to Aix-en-Provence, I was on the lookout for castles, <laughs> but I was housed on the fourth floor of a really old building on the, <laughs> where the first floor was a fish market. <laughs> uh -huh. <clears throat> I had a French roommate. I was excited that I would be able to speak French all the time. She really wanted to learn English, of course. And then I quickly learned that as an American, I was either loved because you know, French, uh, we had helped the French, us Americans during the war, or I was hated because of all those obnoxious, arrogant tourists. So I would kind of pretend I wasn't American. I would speak fake Swedish. Oh, and is he in the Oh, in the I think they figured it out. <sighs> but then I was studying existentialism and how God is dead. And so it was going to be us, up to us humans to take care of the world and each other. C'est trop difficile. Where was the magic, the enchantment, the transformation? Nothing was as I had anticipated, as I had imagined. And yet, the reality of living in another country with all the differences in language, lifestyle, philosophies, it changed me in ways I couldn't have known. And it's helped make me who I am today. Who <laughs> knew? Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see. Que sera, sera. Thank you. Hello, my name is Maria Elena Scott. I'll be reading the short introduction from my recently finished hybrid memoir titled Letters About My Brother, Cartas Acerca de Mi Hermano. I unfold my birth certificate yellowed with age and see the following information about my family of origin typed in the blanks. Acta de Nacimiento, Padres, nombre de la mamá, María Elena Garza. Mother's name, María Elena Garza. Nombre del papá, se ignora. Father's name, unknown. These few words are the sum total of how my story begins. Maternal parents, nothing, nada. Forget paternal, that ship has sailed long ago. The words, Oficina del Registro Civil, H. Matamoros, Estado de Tamaulipas, verify where this official register was drafted. I focus on the official seal of the Mexican eagle perched on a cactus with a writhing serpent in its curved beak. This is the emblem you see displayed in the center of the Mexican flag, known to be one of the world's most beautiful. I was named after my mother, Maria Elena Garza, father's name unknown, have traveled many miles with these few words. I have crossed borders and political boundaries, prayed, pretended that she was everything from a rich, beautiful movie star to an unhappy maid, or maybe even a lady of the night. 
sometimes I just wanted to see her, even if from far away, to know that we resembled each other, to have someone point to her and say, there she is, it's her. Together with my brother Juan, we've tracked and traversed muddy roads as young adults in Matamoros, Tamaulipas, Mexico, knocked on doors to find out more about our mother. I have wandered in dreams and out loud to know these words, Mama, Maria, Elena, Garza, Papa, Se, Ignora. It is time to shake the dust off of these words, fill them up to give them life, drape them in and out of my memory, up and through mi corazón, my heart, through, uh, through my most intimate yearnings to the present. I dedicate this labor of love to my sons, Nicholas and Robert, their father, my college sweetheart, Bob Scott, my family of choice, mis comadres, you know who you are, y amistades, my adopted family, the Tormies, my younger brother, Jose Reyes, to my birth mother, Maria Elena Garza, to my best cheerleader and time traveler, my brother Juan Garza Martinez, also known as John Daniel Tormey, the only known member of my family of origin. And now a poem, also in the book. He was my best cheerleader. Use all of the powers you were given of your Mexicanness, my brother Juan used to say. You can't simply shed the first 10 years of your life at the border and pretend you never were from there. It's not as easy as unzipping an old sweatshirt and tossing it on the floor, even if you weren't technically wet back, mojada, even if you did fly over the Rio Grande on a fancy airplane with your new adopted parents and Jose, dale Maria, you can do it. Harness the knowledge of third world Matamoros orphan survivor. You have created your own familia y poesia. Beloved bilingual maestra teaching kids just like you to be proud of their language and culture. Look at the world you've shaped, punch away your doubts, stand tall, shoulders back, chin up. Mexica, indígena, Adelita, Pachuca, Chicana de mi alma, Maria de mi corazón. Maria, don't give away your power. Remember what Zapata taught us. Más vale morir de pie que vivir de rodillas. It is better to die standing than to live on your knees. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Janine Arsenault. I've been a member of Woodland Patterns Wednesday Writers for a very long time. I'm delighted to be with you today. I'll be reading two poems from our anthology called Each Year Here's a Different Meaning. The anthology is available at Woodland Pattern, and all the proceeds from the sale of this beautiful little book um, will go to benefit Woodland Pattern. I'm reading two poems. One is my own, and one is by Sally Tolan, who, as you know, had lived at um, St. John's for a good while and loved it there. Just loved being part of the beautiful community that you formed. So here's the first poem. Um, it's part of a series of my um, poems about women who were important in my life and who live on even though they passed away. The first one is Becoming Margaret, to Margaret and all who love her. When was the moment you began to slip away from yourself? Was it when you asked who lives here and did not know that it was your home, that it was you who lived in it? Or was it when everyone, husband, sons, daughters, became pleasant strangers? Was it when you looked in the mirror and did not know the face reflected there? Or was it before, long before the signs were visible, palpable, troubling? Whenever that first moment came, it made room for all the slippy moments that followed. Today, we sit near you, next to your hospital bed. Brian addresses you the way he has his whole life, Mama. 
you do not respond. Not one muscle moves in recognition of his voice, of your title. When he says, Margaret, firmly, as your nurse does, you startle and open unfocused eyes. You allow tiny portions of food to be transferred from small plastic cups to your mouth. Cool, smooth bits of food touch your lips while IV bags drip antibiotics and saline into your arm, into your body. Your son feeds you a benediction of love, acceptance, grace, in an ancient ritual, ancient rhythm, call and response, feeding and being fed. Brian whistles an Irish jig, his face softening into a tender smile as he sees your feet under your blanket and bed sheet move to the music. Your eyes may no longer recognize your dear ones, but your feet, your Boston Irish feet, still know a good Irish jig when they hear it. Blessings upon you, Margaret Mary, on this fun, fine, sunlit day in June. The next poem by Sally Toland is called Porch Light. I remember, Larry, would you? We stood on the stoop at my front door in the dusk, dim glim of porch light. I remember, Larry, that you asked me to marry you. And then you said, you said to me, are you sure you would want to marry someone whole? Whole? More whole than you? Then that would be who? Your polio shrunk leg does not cool our heat or lessen our love. Much later, I dreamed of us waltzing, flying across a ballroom like Fred and Ginger. But honey, even that skinny, gimpy leg, you could beat me at tennis, and with your rocking gait, you could walk a baby to sleep in half the time I could. Two good legs would have been great, but think of your sure, strong stroke as you cut through water, the clarity and range of your mind, your big heart, your fast wit, the ecstasy you brought me. Ah, that our young, and we too, might have swum on, danced on together. Thank you. <laughs>